There are some who believe that life here is being monitored by life out there. And there are people here who know it is true. For centuries, people on Earth have experienced a troubling and persistent phenomenon. Many people have vivid memories of being abducted secretly against their will by seemingly non-human entities and undergoing complex psychological and physical experiments. The common misconception is that space is a quiet and desolate vacuum of emptiness. Space is, however, very active. This is Alien Contact. York, England. York is a city with a dark past. Its history is rife with tales of guts, gore, torture, and the paranormal. Phil Shepardson, research chemist who has recently built his own motorcycle, was ready to put it to the test on the winding roads of the Yorkshire countryside. Little did he know this would be a joyride he'd never forget. Because I still do want to believe what my eyes saw that day. I just, I, I, it's got to be a, a perfectly normal explanation for this, and I haven't found one yet. My reality is shopping at Tesco's. It's not me being confronted with something out of this world. What was this? You're going out for a ride on your new scooter, you, you know? The, uh, you're happy that it's not raining, there's no traffic, and then you, suddenly your whole life turns upside down. An unexplainable experience like this has had a surprisingly positive effect on Phil, as he has become more aware of the things around him. Phil often recollects his experience, which ultimately led him to build a telescope which can be found in a museum. Journeying back to the location, Phil experienced the unexplained. It's like time skipped and he's back in 1979. Things didn't equate, but now I'm, I know that the, the whole world stopped with me, basically. This experience was far beyond the reality that anyone knows. It's a blank, and the whole thing's a blank. I, 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 for a lot of years, I knew it existed, but I didn't want to, and even now, I don't want to know it existed. Rugby, England. Rugby is a market town of 78,000 people. The town is credited with being the birthplace of rugby, as well as the birthplace of the jet engine. Colin Saunders' previous employment was within the aircraft and oil industries, but his primary discipline was electrical design draftsman. In his youth, Colin journeyed to many locations for his different work in the aircraft industry. He traveled to Germany for his first contract on an Airbus. From there, he moved on to Aberdeen, where he worked with petroleum, which involved a few offshore trips and helicopter flights. So Colin has had a fair few experiences working on various aircraft. He also spent some time in Sweden, where he gained experience working within the cockpit of an aircraft and on the engine. It's like working in a toy shop for me, and I've always been to air shows and had a look at aircraft in the sky all the time that are flying around, especially since the event. Colin journeys back to the exact location which would change his view of aircraft forever. Back to where it all began on March 31st, 1999. The Saunders family had gathered for an innocent meal at the White Lion. On their way home through the country lanes, they came to the Fosse Way. We came round the bend and there were these lights hovering by the side of the road. They were red and a bit of white mingled in. That's half a mile from where we turned the corner to where the lights were, because I've been back and measured the distance. And we drove towards the lights, talking excitedly about what they could be. Most sightings that come our way 
out of strange lights. They're usually aircraft, or now we have drones, or at certain times of the year, for example, it's the bright stars or planets, and they're miles away. You know, you'll see videos on YouTube or anywhere else, and, oh, I filmed this today, and it's just a little light. Could be anything. Glen Ceiriog, Wales. North Wales boasts some wonderfully beautiful locations, yet the Ceiriog Valley, with its relaxing river and gorgeous surroundings, makes for an ideal break. Well, as some may think. During a short trip away from the busy cities, Sasha Christie and Stephen Midgley traveled to Glen Ceiriog, North Wales, for some time in the countryside. Little did they know they'd come face to face with the unknown. On one clear night, the group enjoyed the sights of the stars that filled the sky above them until everything changed. A triangular craft was spotted across the valley in the sky. Fear began to creep in. As the craft slowly traveled over to them, things started going wrong. So I was up there, he stood here, and he tugged on me like this. And I looked down at him, and his eyes are like this, and his hair's shaking. And he said, Mummy, Mummy, a hand's just come through the hedge and touched my foot. He said, it wasn't my imagination. I saw it with my eyes. It was very strange because I was the last one in. So they were all went in before me. So I just saw them all go exactly back to where they were. Like, just so organically. Like we'd all been out watching fireworks and they were over and come back in because it was cold, you know, that kind of thing. Sometimes I think that maybe our behaviors were dampened. While they were mesmerized by this mysterious craft above them, Suddenly, footsteps approached them at an unimaginable speed. It was the second that I heard the footsteps that everything in my body just was like, you're in danger. I, I couldn't see anything at all. Like everything, I was just, it was just black. There's a narrative that's become a standard that is not necessarily true. If you've seen a UFO, you are being abducted. I couldn't even say that would be an abducted him. No. Experience, what was it? The narrative that's handed to me is that it was aliens, we were abducted. You know, I don't remember anything like that happening. I'm not saying it didn't, but I'm not saying it did either. Just don't know, don't know the nature of it. Now, ridicule has been a very unfortunate factor in this thing. I know, but it's what it boils down to, that anybody who reports one now, they'll say, you, you're crazy, look what the Conan report said. Now, if we let the Conan report go unchallenged, uh, we would be guilty of letting these people be victimized. And there are many people who have been badly hurt by official ridicule after sighting. The airline pilots today, most of them will not report a sighting publicly. And I, many pilots have told me that I wouldn't report one to the Air Force if the thing flew right in the cockpit. In popular culture, the term UFO, or unidentified flying object, refers to a suspected alien spacecraft although its definition encompasses any unexplained aerial phenomena. UFO sightings have been reported throughout recorded history and in various parts of the world, raising questions about life on other planets and whether extraterrestrials have visited Earth. They became a significant subject of interest and the inspiration behind numerous films and books following the development of rocketry after World War II. The narrative that is handed to people is that what they've experienced is, in fact, alien contact. We're told these events are just in the movies, cartoons, and imagination. However, the difference between believing and knowing something exists is essential. A nightmare is a disturbing dream associated with negative feelings, such as anxiety or fear, that awakens you. When we sleep, we cycle through different stages. We start the night in non-rapid eye movement sleep, which gets progressively deeper. We then cycle back until we hit rapid eye movement sleep, REM. During REM sleep, we are most likely to have vivid dreams. At this stage, we are also paralyzed. 
perhaps as a safety mechanism to stop our bodies from acting out the images we are experiencing. But during sleep paralysis, features of REM sleep continue into waking life. Those who experience it will feel awake, yet might experience dreamlike hallucinations and struggle to move. Night terrors occur at particular stages of sleep. Those unlucky enough to experience them will have to endure paralysis, fear, and visions just as they fall asleep. Most causes of these terrors are caused by stressful experiences the sleeper has endured. The first nightmare that really took hold was I was asleep, uh, having nightmares, and then suddenly I was in dentist type chair, I'd be like this basically, but more hooded. And there was someone bearing down on me with a, a mask and a red glow from somewhere, and it was operating on the throat. And that freaked me out to such an extent. And hell, I'm, 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 uh, I'm in the house of out of this world, basically. I'm a very long distance away in space. On Phil's joyride, he didn't like the busy roads or motorways. He wanted to cruise down the country lanes where he could enjoy the views around him as he rode by. As he approached an S bend in the road, he felt an electric charge encompass his body, and suddenly, streets went quiet. As he turned around, he came face to face with an unusually small black object in the field next to him. I got fear. The world seemed to slow down and stop as I was looking across at this craft. And at the time, I just remembered that there's some black humanoid creatures. Call them humanoid, because again, they didn't look right either. They didn't. They're all thinner than, than your normal human, if you like. And they had some sort of black uh, uniform on, which seemed to completely cover them. He can remember the humanoid creatures he saw surrounding the craft, which was covered from head to toe in a black uniform, trying to push the craft away from the side of the road. All I remember is, I've got to get out of here. All he can talk about is what he observed. The rest would just be guesswork, you know? Yeah, uh, so he didn't witness it take off, he took off, <laughs> you know, which we all have that, you know, that, that fear built into us, fight or flight, you know, and on this occasion, you know, Philip decided on flight and decided to uh, get the hell out of there. Rugby England. Staring at the mysterious lights, Colin realized the sky began to ripple and change above him as he soon realized he was standing below an unidentified craft. The craft was suddenly completely visible to his naked eye, as if it was something out of the movies. The craft was a metallic triangular shape, and the way it moved in the sky was like a submarine ascending from water. All of a sudden, it was like somebody put a pair of binoculars up in front of my eyes. I could see it really close. One was the surface of the lines interlocking on top of the liquid. Then there was a second view of the big round nose. It was like six foot in front of me, like I'd got a telescope in front of me. And then there was a side view showing the white central core and the top and bottom were rolled over onto this central core, a bit like the skin on a hovercraft. Then after that third close-up image, my wife decides to drive forward to reverse into a gateway. The effect of this was that driving forward, there was a hedge that blocked the view of the UFO. And we looked in the distance, and there was this large craft going away, the size of a football pitch. And we were assuming that the small one must have gone back to the large one. At the time, because I didn't know anything about UFOs, I thought it was the same craft that had suddenly grown to an enormous size. It was only later when I did research that I realized that was a mothership, and possibly the small one went back to the mothership. This small craft suddenly jolted away from Colin's view, and when he gained visibility again, he came face to face with a craft the size of a football pitch. 
three times the size of his initial encounter. The mothership had arrived. The silence of their surroundings was deafening. No cars, no planes, nothing. Silence. Until the mothership was gone. Normality returned. The sounds of cars and planes echoed in the air. Are they being controlled by men on Earth or by no. men on Earth? No, I'm not referring to the ones which have, have such high speeds and maneuvers at high speeds. They're completely beyond the uh, possibility of anything that we have now or even planning. The speeds and the Air Force has, has put some of these on record. There was one case that they never have explained. Was a, where an object, a very large object, was seen, uh, was tracked by radar, and a number of small objects which were tracked 50, 240 miles an hour from a B-29. And people on board the B-29 saw the small objects. They merged with the big one, which then accelerated to over 9,000 and went off the scope. Or remote control. By, by alien of whom we know nothing. Colin became obsessed with what he'd witnessed that night. He would draw, he would mold, he would build, anything to show the world what it was he witnessed. With all the creations he made, came with strange occurrences around the house. We started to have a few funny things go wrong in the house, and one of those was the hard drive on the computer went. Uh, we had a clock in the cooker that had never worked, and that started working. The television started changing channels on its own, and the video recorder started recording on its own. We had an engineer in, the engineer said the TV receiver had blown. And it was strange, he hadn't seen anything like it before. What was the cause of all these strange phenomena? Were they followed? Who's watching? Who would believe him? York, England. Silence is a common factor when coming face to face with the unknown. As he watches these beings pushing a large craft along the pathway in the field, the questions that flood his brain are endless. This can't be a military aircraft or any man-made craft he knows. The silence around Phil as he locks eyes with an unknown creature was unbearable. What does he do? What will they do to him? We would now classify this as an, a close encounter of the third kind, and that's a, a landing of a, of a UFO seen at close quarters. In, in Philip's encounter, like a lot of other ones, you, you know, you ask the questions. Did it make a noise, Philip? Were there any lights? You know, was the, what, what was these beings that you saw? What were they doing? Was there any reaction to you? And the answer to all that was, was no. There was no smell, no noise. That's one of the strange things, I mean, Virtually everything that we have that flies or drives makes a noise. Even the most knowledgeable among us are surrounded by unknowns. A physicist is likely to believe that the Big Bang created the universe without fully knowing how and why. A theist may believe God answers prayers without knowing how and why. And for those without scientific or religious expertise, Ignorance is even more abundant. How and why does the moon affect the tides? How and why do bad things happen to good people? A non-believer would be someone who did not believe at all in anything connected with UFOs, same way I used to be. Thought it was nonsense, complete nonsense. It took, it took reading hundreds of reports and talking with hundreds of witnesses Many pilots and others, for I was convinced. No, it doesn't. What it should boil down to is this an open investigation, independent of any government agency. Maybe the government would have to provide some, some, but there should be some way of making it open so there would be no chance for charges of uh, being biased to find out what is back of this. Now, let's say that, all right, you don't have to prove the extraterrestrial answer. But here are reports that prove there have been devices under intelligent control, seen, tracked by radar, sometimes simultaneously tracked by two radar stations to get a fix on it. Now, one is often enough, but when you get two that, that uh, confirm identically what is seen visually, 
that's a pretty tight case. We investigate the role of ignorance across science and religion, focusing on ignorance regarding the answers to questions about how or why something is the case. When is this kind of ignorance taken as a basis to question belief? For example, that the moon does cause the tides or that bad things do happen to good people. And when is it a call to action, evidence that inquiry is worth pursuing? When is such ignorance considered a threat? And when is it better accepted and even favored or revered? As our understanding of other planets, the solar system, and the universe grows, we collectively realize that intelligent life must exist outside Earth. But even though attitudes are changing, there's still a fair way to go until sincere open discussion in the mainstream becomes the norm. Glyn Kerriog, Wales. Like many before, Sacha and Stephen once spent a break in the forests in Glen Kerio. And like not so many before, they were hesitant to discuss what happened there. In fear of ridicule and ignorance, they wanted to stay in the shadows until now. I don't like the way that when people in youth come to ufology and they tell their story, that people run away with it, they do what they want with it, use it in their own books. I have got a bit of a reputation for being fierce, but it's not fierceness, it's I'm protecting myself. It, it, it's dangerous. So that's why I'm fierce. That's why I'm protective of what happened. I want to keep it exactly as I say. When it comes to the case of Sasha Christie, whenever you talk to Sasha about this encounter, you can see it's, it's bothered her. Sasha's not a shrinking violet in, in any respect. I've been patient as well because I didn't want to expose Steve and Danya. It was Steve who came to me and said that he wanted to talk about it now. So, you know, we ended up coming forward together. There's so much hearsay nowadays. There's so much uh, manipulation. You know, everybody would like to get a story. They want to be up there. They want to prove their point. I no longer need to prove my point. The only person I need to prove my point to is myself. I still don't know what really happened that particular night. Skeptics will talk. They will conjure up their own descriptions. They mix and match accounts of different individuals to create the best story. York, England. Is this real? Did Phil just come face to face with an extraterrestrial? The world stopped around him when he locked eyes with this unknown creature. Apprehension mixed with curiosity fills Phil's existence. The need to visit the location where this encounter unfolded continues to exist in his mind. Upon his return, he came face to face with nothing but not a disappointment, nothing but the kind of nothing that will fill any individual's mind with questions. There was a triangle shape of nothingness in the middle of the field where nothing had grown. It was utterly barren of any form of vegetation at all. Philip told us that, you know, for certainly there was where this object had been, you know, uh, nothing would grow. And that, that's not, you know, uh, unique. We've had such cases in different parts of the world where the, the, the soil and the growth was, was altered as a result. What that says about the subject and the phenomenon is, is a different argument, of course. It confirmed to Philip that this was something quite bizarre and not, nothing conventional. Glyn Kerriog, Wales. It's not uncommon for people to want to experience the unknown once, let alone return to locations they've been to before. But of course, no place is the same twice. Visiting a location in the dead of night will be different to visiting it in the day. Trees look less intimidating, shadows less scary. This didn't happen all of a sudden. This happened gradually, until the craft Sasha and Stephen were seeing was almost above them. And I drove in the middle of the night. I was in Wolverhampton. It just, Steve, get in the van. 
you can't sleep, drive out there. I felt the need to go back because I was still questioning. This is four years after the occurrence. I was still questioning, would I see, should I go back? I have work the next day, but no, let's just go, fun. But as life has moved on, I feel quite comfortable with the situation. I still don't have any answers. One of the things that the late Dr. Heineck suggested was, is that we concentrate on encounters that he called high strangeness. In other words, things that weren't a little light three miles away or in the night sky, things that one were rather seen up close. It's not impossible, but it's less likely that we're going to be misidentifying everyday ordinary objects. You know, because if you're that close to it, then you should be able to recognize exactly what it was, or in this instant, what it wasn't. The point when I called upon Sasha, who came out straight away, we both stood there looking, and it was starting to grow in the sky where it was actually starting to move over. This is when it became apparent there were more going on in the center of it and I didn't know whether the, the effect around it was to do with what was going on in the middle of it because it seemed to be slowly but surely taking over mm -hmm. the sky for me. It was like this. It was just moving through the different densities of the clouds. Uh -huh. So it kind of rippled, but it wasn't like tentacles. It wasn't like a living creature. It was like a light. jellyfish effect. It just it looked kind effect. of like a jellyfish within the clouds. It seemed to be circling in a, a clockwise, but swirling anti-clockwise. As it started to move over, it would be going round, but in anti-clockwise, but in the middle, was, it was the effect. was in that saw us because it wasn't even coming in our direction it saw you it saw me um, I don't know how whatever technology was in it because well, we were we were miles and miles away from it but it vectored in on us and it came to our position Where attention directly. goes energy flows I'm a great believer in that is before I actually kind of really <laughs> looked into that side of things but I've never seen any kind of life form with a UFO I cannot say that they go together because I don't know that they do. I mean, that is a total assumption. There's a house opposite, like right further off on the opposite side of the valley on another hill. And when we were walking around yesterday and I said to Steve, imagine if you were looking out of the window from that property there, what you would have seen, you know? I mean, it, they would have seen what we saw, but it's a tiny village and it's not very active, is it? So now we want to move on to flying triangles. They've been seen all around the world since at least 1974, without a doubt. Uh, we've got November 29th, 1989, Belgium was seen. January 5th, 2000, Southern Illinois. Area 51, Groom Lake. They've been seen almost in every country by every possible culture. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. March 31st, 1999, Kirby. A very significant sighting. And if anyone in this room is a skeptic, I just invite you to look at this gentleman's testimony, Colin Saunders, you can Google him. He gave a really nice 20 minute lecture regarding this particular sighting. A very honest gentleman. I, I totally believe his case. This thing was uh, approximately 50 feet across in conjunction with a Cessna 172 that has a 27 foot wingspan. Here's Colin Sanders here. Here's his UFO model. And when I saw that UFO model, I said, wow, I want to have one of those. This is only a recent build that we had done. We did these a few years ago, but it's taken a while to get to the proper model that I wanted. So overall, we're looking at a period of about 20 years. Just recently, I've seen this exact model on a program by Stephen Greer. I know that he has got that model from 
Michael Schrack, who I sent these drawings to. Now, he is telling people this is a man-made craft and that this is the propulsion system at the back. I feel like I'm on a bit of a mission. That's why I started building the models. I just got obsessed with it. During the course of the research, people I've, I've spoken to have had close encounters more than often go on to have other encounters. Not necessarily UFO, but paranormal encounters. We all would like to find a logical explanation, and there may well be one. You know, the magnetic pull of the land, there's mines, if it's copper, if it's slate. Not, none of it explains what it was, though. But then you think, well, hang on a minute, what happens with the strobe lights and the effects of the people? Yeah. You well, know, hang on a minute, and it's only a flickering of a matter of seconds, but it's where did, where did that come from? There's nothing here to do that. Here is another UFO bulletin. The Defense Department has just announced that the unidentified flying object has suddenly disappeared from our radar screen. They believe the object has either disintegrated in space or it may be a spaceship from some other planet which has the ability to nullify our radar beams. Because of the ominous situation, the President has ordered the Strategic Air Command into action. York, England. Is the first thing to come to mind an alien experience, an abduction? The only thing I can recall is the strange shape and also um, the nerving silence of everything. And, and then that blank nothing at all. How can somebody be taken out of a complete time frame, basically? What I've seen and experienced does not go with my telescopes, with my astronomical outlook. And, and the two don't mix. We know as UFO researchers that most people don't actually report their sightings anyway. So there could well be witnesses, we just never found them. Now, next on Outside Source, we're going to learn how a global team of astronomers have announced they found what could be evidence of life elsewhere, and not on Mars, but on the much more inhospitable Venus. Here's one of the team. So what we think we found is phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus. Now, on a rocky planet like the Earth, phosphine is a rare gas, and it's mainly the result of life. Um, so it's what we call a biosignature. Now, on the Earth, uh, phosphine is caused by human activity, so through industry or through microorganisms or microbes. And so finding a gas like this on Venus is really exciting because of the possibility that it could have also been produced by life like it is on the Earth. If we as a species can evaluate ourselves scientifically that there is life somewhere else, that would open up the floodgates. Hopefully, a confined full gaze uh, towards that we are not alone and we do exist amongst an extraterrestrial species. And I might not be ridiculed anymore. <laughs> the interdimensional hypothesis is a proposal that unidentified UFO sightings are the result of experiencing other dimensions that coexist separately alongside our own in contrast with either the extraterrestrial hypothesis that suggests UFO sightings are caused by visitations from outside the Earth, or the psychosocial hypothesis that argues UFO sightings are best explained as a psychological or social phenomenon. The hypothesis has been advanced by UFO enthusiasts such as Mead Lane, John Keel, J. Allen Hynek, and Jacques Vallée. Proponents of the interdimensional hypothesis argue that UFOs are a modern manifestation of a phenomenon that has occurred throughout recorded human history, which in prior ages were ascribed to mythological or supernatural creatures. The world as we know it has three dimensions of space, length, width, and depth, and one dimension of time. But there's the mind-bending possibility that many more dimensions exist out there. Rugby, England. The hardest part is letting go, letting go of what it might be, letting go of the unknown, but it keeps coming back. I, I just think it's such a fantastic experience that to let it go would be such a waste. It would be such a disappointment to those who have made it happen to me. What actually happened, I'm pretty convinced it was a, an alien craft. 
as we like to call them, from another world. I, I think it's like a parallel world that it's come from. And it's been done, I believe it's been done for a reason. These creatures are so advanced and they know us so well. And the fact that they hide themselves, but this particular night, it wasn't hiding. It was totally different. It was like a Christmas tree at the side of the road waiting for us. So why did they do that? That is just not normal for a UFO to be doing that sort of thing. It's been done for a reason. I hope one day I realise what the reason is, unless this is the reason now that I'm helping such a subtle dis disclosure of the alien agenda. The most probable answer was observation by extrater extraterrestrial uh, beings uh, or controlled machines making observations of the Earth. Now this, this is exactly what the Air Force said in 1948. They've had a top secret estimate of the situation which said that these things were interplanetary devices. And they, they've denied it for years, but they finally it was admitted. Ask most anyone whether life exists on other planets and moons, and you'll get a confident yes. Going back decades, and in many ways generations, we've been introduced to a menagerie of extraterrestrials, good and bad. Their presence suffuses our entertainment and culture, and we humans seem to have an almost innate belief, or is it a hope, that we are not alone in the universe. But that extraterrestrial presence on regular display is, of course, a fiction. No life beyond Earth has ever been found. There is no evidence that alien life has ever visited our planet. It's all a story. This does not mean, however, that the universe is lifeless. While no clear signs of life have ever been detected, the possibility of extraterrestrial biology, the scientific logic that supports it, has grown increasingly plausible. That is perhaps the single largest achievement of the burgeoning field of astrobiology, the broad-based study of the origins of life here and the search for life beyond Earth. By exploring and illuminating the world of extreme life on Earth, by experimenting with how life here began, by understanding more about the chemical makeup of the cosmos, by testing for habitability on missions to Mars, Jupiter's moon Europa, Saturn's moon Titan, and beyond. An enormous body of science is being assembled to analyze and explain the origins, characteristics, and possible extraterrestrial dimensions of life. And unlike the ETs and starship invaders of popular culture, these discoveries are, and will be, real. If it is dimensional, maybe one day we will learn to use these dimensions to cross over and possibly to travel to further dimensions. Imagine there's a planet out there in our solar system that evolved a million years ahead of us. Maybe they've learned how to do this. We don't know all of the technology. And like I say, all of this is a science that we do not yet understand. The, the believer is someone who accepts the idea that there are real UFOs and directs his attention to the question, why are they here? Uh, what are they doing? What do they want from us? What are their motivations? Uh, there is the assumption of intelligence uh, or intelligent control, but not necessarily uh, the assumption of direct communication uh, between these intelligences and our own intelligence. The more we learn about the cosmos, the more it seems possible that we are not alone. The entire galaxy is teeming with worlds, and we're getting better at listening. So the question, is there anybody out there, is one we may be able to answer soon. But do we really want to know? If aliens are indeed out there, would they be friendly explorers or destroyers of worlds? This is a serious question no longer confined to science fiction because a growing group of astronomers have taken it upon themselves to do more than listen. Some are advocating for a beacon swept across the galaxy, letting ET know we're home to see if anyone comes calling. 
Others argue that we would be wise to keep Earth to ourselves. I feel that uh, over a period of time, a couple of years now, that I have been in a position to look at some of the evidence. And certainly I have not seen all of the evidence that might be pertinent. Uh, I too have been driven in the direction of uh, recognizing that there are cases that are not explainable in conventional terms. Uh, this at least leaves us with the existence of a real UFO. Uh, beyond that, there is the question of whether some of these real UFOs may be under intelligent control. Again, uh, at the present time, I would say that I have seen evidence that is readily interpretable in such terms, but which may also be susceptible of other interpretation. Well, uh, for a while, I actually did think it was aliens and that uh, they were benevolent. Um, and, but I was trying to find some comfort. I was trying to find a comfortable place to be with it. I don't know if it was aliens. I don't know if aliens exist as in, like, space traveling or interdimensional. I wouldn't even know how interdimensional anything would work. But I've had physical encounters with something, and so have my family. So based on this, it has to be real. Are UFOs real evidence that aliens have come to Earth to visit, to examine, to colonize? The answer lies in exploring the skies and looking for more evidence of the strange, the mysterious, and the unexplained. We may never know the full agenda of the beings responsible for alien encounters. Further research is needed. Each new encounter, however, increases our understanding of alien agendas and prepares us for the day when we will have full disclosure. This is Alien Contact.